Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Sages for the invitation to present. Today, I'll be discussing the long-term durability and nutritional outcomes for laparoscopic jejunostomy tubes and percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tubes with jejunal extension. We have no disclosures for this presentation. The clicker's not working. It is well established. Oh, wait, this is not. It's, the red goes back. Yeah. You guys have a different clicker. You can use the mouse. Oh, this is all back. That's forward. Okay. All right, so just use the clicker. Okay. It is well established that enteral nutrition is the preferred method of nutritional supplementation for patients who cannot tolerate oral alimentation. It is also well established that the stomach is the ideal site for enteral nutrition feeding. Nevertheless, the jejunum can serve as an alternative site for patients who cannot tolerate gastric enteral feeds. Access to the jejunum can be obtained through both endoscopic and surgical procedures. The two most commonly performed procedures are the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube, which is jejunal extension, also known as the peg jet tube, and the laparoscopic jejunostomy tube. At our institution, consultation for peg jet tube placement occurs more commonly than consultation for laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement due to the perceived decreased risk of an endoscopic procedure. Nevertheless, there remains a paucity of data comparing the short and long-term durability of these different tube types. Therefore, the purpose of our study was to compare the PEG jet tube to the laparoscopic J tube with respect to re-intervention rates and nutritional outcomes. In order to do this, retrospective chart review was performed on all patients who underwent either PEG jet tube placement or laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement from January 2005 through December 2015 who had at least 30-day follow-up. Patients who underwent peg jet tube placement or laparoscopic J tube placement at the time of esophagectomy or for post-bariatric surgery complications and those patients with less, less than 30-day follow-up were excluded from our analysis. Patients who underwent peg jet tube placement were compared to those patients who underwent laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement with respect to preoperative patient variables, intraoperative variables, 30-day outcomes, and long-term outcomes defined as greater than six months post-procedure. A total of 343 patients met inclusion criteria. 88 of these patients underwent peg jet tube placement, while 255 patients underwent laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement. With respect to preoperative patient demographics, Patients who underwent laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement were more likely to be female and had a higher average preoperative albumin level. With respect to indications for tube placement, patients who underwent peg jet tube placement were significantly more likely to have dementia, were less likely to have gastroparesis, and were more likely to have a diagnosis of either aspiration or intestinal malabsorption. With respect to previous enteral access type, it is not surprising that patients who underwent peg jet tube placement were significantly more likely to have had a previous peg tube and a laparoscopic jejunostomy tube. Also, at our institution, it is common for patients being considered for laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement to have a trial period of nasal jejunal tube feeding. Therefore, it is not surprising that patients who underwent laparoscopic J tube placement were significantly more likely to have had previous nasal jejunal tube feeding. 87.5% of the patients who underwent peg jet tube placement had their jejunal extension secured using the suture clip method. 2% of patients in the laparoscopic jejunostomy tube group required conversion to an open procedure. The average jejunostomy tube site for, for patients who underwent peg jet tube placement was 12 French, while it was 16 French for patients who underwent laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement. With respect to 30-day outcomes, Patients who underwent PEG-JET tube placement 
were significantly more likely to experience a tube dislodgement event defined as migration of the jejunal extension back into the stomach and were also more likely to experience a 30-day re-intervention. With respect to nutritional outcomes, patients in the PEGJET group were significantly less likely to reach their enteral feeding goals and were more likely to require nutritional supplementation with TPN. With respect to long-term outcomes, Patients who underwent PEGJET tube placement were less likely to experience a tube site leak, but were more likely to experience a tube occlusion event. These patients were also more likely to experience a readmission or re-intervention related to their tube. Finally, patients in the PEGJET group were more likely to require nutritional supplementation with TPN. A total of 18 patients in the PEGJET group and 71 patients in the laparoscopic jejunostomy tube group were successfully weaned from enteral nutrition over the long term. 15 patients in the PEGJET group went on to undergo laparoscopic jejunostomy tube placement. In conclusion, laparoscopic jejunostomy tube is superior to the PEGJET tube with respect to long-term durability and nutritional outcomes. Therefore, laparoscopic jejunostomy tube should be first-line method for jejunal enteral access. Do you think the selection bias that, um, that you introduced with the differences in the patient population had any impact on the outcomes that you saw between the two groups? You mean like for the indications of the procedure? Right. Um, you know, I think that's always a possibility, sure. Um, but I think the kind of the biggest hurdle that we overcame is some patients such as the um, Patients who had esophagectomy or post-bariatric patients, they can't have a PEGJET tube, and so we wean them out kind of to avoid any selection bias between the two groups. Any questions from the mic? Great. Thank you very much.